Okay, well, good afternoon to those in Geneva and good afternoon, good morning, maybe good evening to those online. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, welcome to this session hosted by the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, which is part of the Global Protection Cluster as we support coordination on HLP um, in humanitarian response around the globe. So whether you join online or you're in the room, welcome. Um, currently have, I think, around 41 online, so, and less than that in the room, but I'm sure uh, we'll all <laughs> contribute in our different ways. So yeah, thanks for being here, everybody. So I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the, uh, one of the co-coordinators of the HLP AOR, and that's led now by NRC, which is where I'm based, and by UN Habitat. Um, and Ombretta is the co-coordinator, and I see her online there. Um, Ombretta, give us a wave. There we go. Um, so, yeah, thanks for being here. And today we're going to uh, discuss um, the idea around housing, land and property as this sort of golden thread that comes sort of right throughout kind of humanitarian response and into solutions that we need to make these connections across these uh, different parts of our work that too often get siloed. Um, I'm not the first person to talk about silos in, the, in, this, in this kind of work, but I think through HLP, it gives quite an interesting lens to look at these things. So the title today has a, a question mark after it. Um, interested to know if you think the question mark should be there or if it should be more of a, a statement. Um, maybe we can ask again at the end and see if it, it's changed your view throughout the session. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye out for the threads in the different presentations we're going to hear from um, a number of different people. Um, we're going to hear from colleagues who are sort of working at that kind of global level supporting HLP work. And then we're going to look at an operational uh, level. We're going to have colleagues from Mali, South Sudan, Somalia and Syria sharing about their work linked to housing, land, property and how it kind of cuts across these different parts of a response. Um, and yeah, this is going to be um, part of a sort of an ongoing piece of work where we're trying to, um, I suppose, make make the connections more understood and look for opportunities to build better connections across different areas of our work so there'll be more to follow on this as well um, first so just before we get started properly a couple of notices um, we're recording the session so we can share it if you want to say anything controversial just tell me and i'll stop the recording so you're very welcome to do that um, whether online or in the room. My editing skills aren't great, so better to, to sort of forewarn me. Um, we will have time for some questions and discussions, but because of that, I'm going to be a bit strict with the timekeeping. So I'm known as a ruthless uh, kind of person, so I will be exercising that to the max. Um, for those speaking, when you've got a minute left, I'll start sort of doing this, just so you know, and then when your time's up, I'll start making some kind of noise so that you know. Uh, watch out for that. And if you're online, please do introduce yourself in the chat, um, ask questions there. And we have you know, people online and in the room who will be monitoring that and we can answer questions there as well. Or better, of course, please answer <laughs> online questions if they're to do with HOPAOR as well as you and Habitat and, and others as well. So um, yeah, feel free to introduce yourselves online in the room. We'll have to introduce ourselves afterwards, although we could almost go around. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, yes, we'll have to do our sort of chat function afterwards. Um, great. OK, so let's begin. So first of all, I would like to um, welcome uh, Brigitte Oderlin from uh, SDC, and um, she is going to uh, offer some opening remarks uh, from, from her perspective. Over to you. Well, thank you, Jim, and um, dear colleagues, and greetings from Burns. Apologies for not being able to, to be in Geneva today. But um, yes, briefly on housing, land, and property, those matters are at the heart of displacement, because when people are displaced, they are forced to leave their home and land without knowing where they will be living and whether they will be ever be able to go back. Our experience as SDC and in supporting NRC and the global HLP area of responsibility indicates that HLP issues arise in one form or the other in all contexts affected by conflict, disaster, displacement, and during every phase of response. 
the HLP challenges created by repeated and protracted displacement are made worse by the limited legal and policy framework around HLP rights, inadequate technical and functional capacities of state institutions, and weak mechanism for the resolution of HLP disputes. Furthermore, displaced people themselves often lack knowledge of their HLP rights and how to exercise them. Women's access to HLP rights are often adversely affected due to entrenched discrimination and limited or inadequate tenure security among IDPs and returnees places households at risk of exploitation from landlords. The threat of eviction represents one of the most serious protection concerns with enormous impact on the victim's dignity, physical security, livelihood, and most importantly, their search for durable solutions. It is positive and important to acknowledge that there is an uh, increasing recognition of the importance of HLP in humanitarian response and its role as a vital component of long-term durable solution. We see this recognition reflected in the HLP AOR, the host for this session with UN Habitat joining NRC in co-leading with HLP AOR, reflecting the growing interest in coordination on HLP and the need to deepen links between humanitarian and durable solution approaches. Within NRC, we see renewed efforts to integrate HLP across programming within the shelter and CCM clusters. Uh, we see with the importance of considering HLP in other areas of responsibility and in its effort to integrate the impact of climate change and nexus approaches into its humanitarian responses. However, whilst there is growing interest in HLP and durable solution from government, the UN system and donors, it is vital to maintain the emphasis on HLP as a critical part of humanitarian response. We need to combine immediate response to people under threat of forced eviction with improved security of tenure and the legal policy and administrative systems that make this possible. This is why we can think of HLP as a catch-all term for this golden thread between emergencies and solutions, which cannot be neglected at either end of a response if we are to see effective outcomes and people living with safety, security, and dignity. This golden thread has many strands. I will mention four of these strands, drawing on the work of the Jubaland Solution Consortium in Somalia that is pertinent for the region and the globe. First, on the need for humanitarian programming to focus on improving security as tenure of tenure as part of a longer term strategy to reduce the threat of eviction. Second, government leadership is imperative in advancing HLP objectives. Third, developing the HLP policy and legal framework in countries is critical to ending displacement. And fourth, women's access to HLP must be prioritized. Today, uh, we will be hearing about what this golden thread means in reality on the ground from colleagues living and working in Mali, Somalia, South Sudan, and Syria. These examples will lead to opportunities to uh, proactively ensure our efforts are increasingly coherent and effective, making good on our commitments for joined up responses, meeting people needs and minimizing the risk they face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, thank you for those, those words. Um, and um, yeah, apologies for the bings of the chat in the room. I don't know how to mute that on here. So um, I'm having to go through the browser. So if anyone has any no insight, problem. please do. But apologies to, for all the bings. Um, great. Thank you, uh, Brigitte, uh, for those those opening words. And um, yeah, I'm going to go straight now to um, uh, Ibire Lopez, who is with um, I IOM. And um, he is, can you just change this? No, no, it's okay. I think if you go to the calendar and click on the meeting, you can mute the chat. Oh, there we go. Right. Awesome. We'll try that. 
Thank you. Um, Ibere, I'm going to pass to you now. Um, so Ibere Lopez is the Global HLP Advisor with IOM and also uh, works as an HLP Advisor for the Global Shelter Cluster as well. And you're going to give us, uh, yeah, sort of some of the sort of perspective from, from where you sit. So, yeah, over to you, Ibere. All right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, this this question of uh, if HRP is the golden thread uh, between uh, humanitarian peace and, and development. And I, I don't know if it is the golden thread, but it's definitely one of them. Um, it, when let's let's try to bring it to um, to practice. So uh, what do we what how is HRP dealt with in in the humanitarian humanitarian setting? So in humanitarian setting. Um, why do we need HRP intervention? We need an HRP intervention because we are working on lands. We are usually working on uh, providing shelter to uh, displaced people. Uh, sometimes it's still in uh, camp settings, so we need to make sure that the land or the area where they're going to be either resettled or reestablished um, is secure in terms of knowing that they will be able to stay there for as long as it, it needs. And uh, and that's that's one of the steps where uh, usually that's not done because of the uh, because we're we're rushed and because of the the urgency of providing the land for the site we go we immediately um, uh, take uh, at face value what the government tells us saying this land is available it belongs to the government you can go and do your IDP site over there. Um, but when you go, we find out later, after doing the site planning and all the improvements, that uh, that wasn't the case, right? So we lose a lot of time, we lose a lot of investment from the humanitarian sector, the resources from donors, and we put the, the IDPs in, a, in another situation of risk. Then uh, on the peace side, I think that's where we fail the most, which is... Um, when you have conflicts, uh, you you have displacement, and you also have uh, secondary occupation and fraudulent expropriation of properties. You have um, people losing their lands, leaving behind their their property, and and wanting to have them back, but not having a a pathway for that um, in the post conflict context. And those um, these situations become drivers, very strong drivers of further conflict, and they become very strong obstacles for achieving peace. And it's very rare to see any uh, HLP programming that tackles uh, mass restitution or that tackles restitution uh, or that tackles restitution um, for with the purpose of um, of reinforcing and achieving and strengthening peace. So that's the the peace side of it. And then on the development side, you have um, the the need to provide security of tenure, so people can have a the the peace of mind and the predictability that is needed for them to rebuild their lives and invest in their own property, and also um, unlock the inherent inherent value of their immovable asset, which is something that um, it's not achieved in, in most countries where we work uh, because people don't have security of tenure, they don't have the title documents um, and they there's no there's no enforcement of the of the rights. Uh, they can't use their immovable assets as as collateral to access credit. Uh, so they can't um, borrow against that asset. They can't uh, use the assets to leverage their um, their uh, self reliance. So, so that's where the development part uh, goes. Now, how do you how do you thread that that <laughs> that needle through the three um, through the three phases of uh, of intervention? And that's the the problem that I think we we could uh, start discussing now. But but before that, I think that we need to um also be better at um at doing them separately 
first because I don't think we do that yet, right? So we do have um, um, HRP is still uh, uh, mostly an accessory uh, for humanitarian practice, right? We don't have an HRP uh, cluster. We don't have an HRP, um, um, you know, area of intervention like we have wash and shelter, etc. So HRP programming is mostly accessory. Uh, in rare cases, you have uh, a few HLP programming, but they're they're limited. But we don't have um, a comprehensive HLP programming in these three um, phases, let's say, of intervention. Um, and then uh, linking them is is a is a second challenge. So that's what I wanted to put to the group, and uh, we can start discussing with the practical examples that will will come through this session. Thanks, Adire. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, raising a, a challenge there, like how do we even think of HLP in the work that we do do? And uh, you know, where can we have it further integrated, more an integral part of how we think about you know, risk and do no harm, as well as how we look to longer term and, and, and other aspects as well. So thanks for those, um, those thoughts, uh, those provocations and some good challenge there that we'll uh, look to address. Um, thank you. So now moving on to our colleagues from Mali. We thought we sort of muted this, but we haven't worked it out, so I apologise. I think it's because it's through the browser and I can't work it out. So. Anyway, I'm going to um, over to colleagues in Mali. We're joined by uh, Emma Yo from the um, from NRC in Mali, and she also supports the HLP working group there. Uh, and Emma, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So HLP in Mali, we will talk about the challenges of a neglected uh, link between humanitarian re response and solution. Uh, the presentation here will focus on the key points of the context of the crisis in Mali, the protection situation, the HLP challenges, the response of HLP need, and the importance of maintaining the link to the solution. Crisis in Mali. The country has been weakened since 2012 by a complex crisis. Several <laughs> regions are under the control of no state harm groups. The security situation continues to deteriorate and is gradually spilled, spreading to the southern region, leading to numerous population displacements. As as of end of 2022, uh, we can note that uh, 412,000 people were internally displaced in Mali. Several regions experienced flood that caused significant damage and affected the population, such as destruction of shelter, loss of crops, livestock, and etc. As shown on the map, uh, I think that we have a connection issue. We can't see the, uh, the presentation. Are you there? We can hear you and also yes, see the we, presentation. We at hear least you online. And, and can yeah, see the presentation here. Okay. We, yeah, we can see the picture of the map. It's the slide with crisis in Mali. Okay. That, as shown on the map, you can see in red color the most affected area, uh, a little more than two thirds of the territory. What about protection situation? This situation has absolutely led to protection issue. So, uh, according to forced displacement uh, protection situation in Mali, forced displacement on the rise with 412,000 IDPs, uh, re, uh, according to the DTM report. In 20, in 2012, we noted that uh, 20, 200, uh, 228,000 uh, IDPs, uh, an increase of more than 90% of IDP numbers. We for uh, 20, 2012. We have eight. We have we can notice also eight 
uh, millions, eight millions, about eight millions of uh, total population of 21 million in Mali need humanitarian assistance, according also to uh, HRP in Mali. Two million people in equity need of assistance. People in need in pot of protection, we we have about four uh, million more severely affected regions. So uh, with humanitarian condition by label four, we can have, if you see the map, Gao, Menaka, Tombuktu in the north, and Mopti, Segu, Kidal, uh, with level three, Kulikoro in the center of the country. In this context, what also about HLP challenges? We have ongoing HLP challenges, always according to HNO in Mali. The humanitarian response targets uh, about 718,000 uh, IDPs with funding of uh, in Mali, with funding of uh, 14, 14 million. Uh, what are the challenges? HLP challenges in Mali. Threats of eviction of IDPs in housing at a 70% rate according to the multi-sectoral need assessment. Significant secondary occupation of public and private property by displaced persons. The high risk of insecurity of Turner, uh, about 81 Android uh, IDPs and security in the reception of seat and or private seat. For example, in Faladier seat in Bamako, Senu Segu, and recently in Sevare. In Sevare, um, less than three days, uh, uh, the seat of Sevare has been attacked with a car full of explosives. So uh, the seat of Sevare is in the center of uh, Mali, uh, in, in, in Mopti. Uh, the IDPs were settled, heard, settled there due to the availability of the seat. So uh, 28 displaced households was assigned to a seat, to the seat. So uh, also, we can talk about a significant number of land conflict related to the crisis. Example, uh, 394 cases in 2023. The risk of tension between community and IDPs over the management of natural resources. The castle theft, uh, we, note, when we noted 182 cases reported. A high rate of lost property uh, documentation, 78% uh, according to the NMSI in, 20, in 2022 in Mali. Response in the HLP challenge in Mali, need of an, of an, of for a humanitarian and sustainable response. To ensure the security safety, and dignity of affected population in all phases of the conflict, emergency, transition, and long term. Land security is a crucial element of humanitarian action in Mali. In order to prevent eviction, which creates new displacement and homeless. In the long term, security, securing the land right provides the necessary basic for agriculture and industry and contribute to sustainable peace process. Direct correlation between conflict, stable property rights and food security. We know that conflict over the land and natural resources are often at the heart of conflict. Territorial gains and the accompanying of occupation of the land housing lead of the population displacement. At the end of the conflict, Disputes over occupied property remain a source and instability that prevents any lasting solution for returning population and treating already fragile peace agreements. So access to land to natural resources is increasingly present 
in peace negotiation and resulting agreements. Conflict between, for example, the example of the conflict between Pearl and Dogon in the center of Mali, community with a peace agreement noting the free exploitation of natural and land resources by community, field, uh, also corridor housing, etc. Access to land is necessary for shelter, water, sanitary, and hygiene. Live food, food security, and camp management. So we can also talk about that combined formal and customary access and ownership rights. HLP in, for now, we can talk about also for HLP in humanitarian response in Mali, a hope of a nascent line. HLP integrated into the H, uh, HLP only in 2020, the establishment of the working group in 2022. Continue advocacy with OCHA, uh, with the support of the protection cluster in Mali, the global cluster protection, and also the global HLP hour. However, saving life, avoiding further displacement and abuse of human rights is more than ever viewed in the context of Mali and especially in the Sahel. A conflict again a backdrop of slavery for access for natural resources. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, really interesting to hear the links between you know, what you need to do in the emergency as people are displaced to try and protect them, but then also how, uh, particularly around land, the links between long, you know, with longer term efforts to think about food security and, uh, you know, documentation as well, but also the link to peace discussions, peace negotiations and processes. So lots of different aspects there. Um, and, you know, I know in, in, in Mali there is um, efforts being made around, sort of around mediation that includes um, um, lands and access to natural resources is a key part of that. So, um, yeah, it's a, a, a really kind of challenging example of, of where these things meet and um, uh, for us to think how best we can uh, support and respond. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, South Sudan, so across east uh, on the continent of Africa, and uh, welcome to uh, speak to us um, uh, Peter Deng, who's the Head of Protection Programs with the Humanitarian and Development Consortium in HDC. Um, and HDC are co-leads of the HLP AOR in South Sudan, um, alongside um, IOM and NRC. Uh, so Peter is going to speak to us, and I believe he may also be joined by uh, Peace Mababzi, who's the NRC ICLA specialist and also co-lead of the uh, South Sudan HLP AOR. Over to you, Peter. Hi, uh, yes, good good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Jim, for the introduction. I think uh, we have planned that uh, my colleague, Peace, will uh, do some bit of introductions and then I'll go ahead with the presentation, if that's okay. Of course, please, Peace. Okay. Uh, thank you. And All right, thank, you. thank you, Jim. And it is good afternoon here, and I hope it is that side. I, I myself, Peace Mbabazi Rijemar, the ECLA specialist of NRC South Sudan. I also uh, lead, co lead the HLP area responsibility together with IOM and HDC. Uh, it is a triad arrangement, and NRC as the chair, and then, um, then we have uh, HDC and IOM as the co leads. Okay, uh, I will start with the situation in Sudan. We currently have about uh, roughly more, slightly over 4 million people that are displaced, about 2.2 million um, displaced in country, and then the rest of the 2 million displaced outside country. But what we're starting to see right now, we are starting to see a slow, a trend in um, quite a number of returns happening currently in South Sudan. And they are happening both in country and cross border. We are registering quite a number of returns from especially um, Uganda, but also with the current crisis that is happening in Sudan, we are also seeing um, a number of people crossing the border from Sudan and returning back in South Sudan. The same is also happening on the border of um, so South Sudan together uh, with, with Chad. And that brings about slightly over 2 million people 
according to the existing data. Uh, currently, we see HLP as uh, a crossing, a cross-cutting issue, both as a humanitarian issue, but also uh, as um, both in emergence and also as a development issue. And quite a number of interventions are being done, notwithstanding the challenges. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing that is quite difficult is the HLP solutions related to HLP solutions such as uh, com compensation and restitution. Um, without much or uh, emphasis, I will allow my colleague to come through. But and the rest of the of it will be covered within our presentation. Thank you. Dan, yeah, over. Th thank you. Ah, yes, yes, thank you very much, Peace Mbawazu. Um, yeah, so generally that is the situation in South Sudan and uh, um, uh, the HLP, um, one of the key things, of course, generally the situation, the conflict in South Sudan, of course, at first there was a political conflict and now what we are seeing happening is more of the intercommunal uh conflict and that one there's the it is somehow connected with the it's connected with land issues like in central equatoria we also have floods that are displacing people and will always need to hlp so without taking much on that as uh, my colleague uh, uh, peace had done the, the introduction on the context i will go to the the five key challenges on HLP that we see in South Sudan. Uh, the number one is the weak land administration and the dispute resolution mechanism. You know, uh, you remember all, if you may know, when South, South Sudan had just received its independence in 2011 and then just immediately two years after the conflict erupted, until now we're still in that period. So there has not been that uh, strong administration that has been put up and the country has really been affected. So you can see there that there's lack of availability and efficient uh, way of landing, uh, handling land. You know, this one is particularly with the, uh, there is a land act, but there is no policy to guide the government institutions in administering the land. And we see that there are sometimes uh, misunderstanding among the government institution as to who should do who and you know there's that power struggle you know so um and then there is also uh, the financial burden uh, of providing land ownership you know when you have your land for you to get it it's uh, to get the proper documentation is very expensive like the, if you have to do the land survey because if you have your land you have to pay the surveyors to come and do the survey, to put up the, the coordinates and those things, which is very expensive. And uh, to the IDPs or returnees, we see that one is really very expensive. And in the end, they end up losing their land as well. Because if you're not able to construct with time, your land is also grabbed. So that is also another key challenge and the uh, lack of uh, legislation implementation. You know, uh, what we know in South Sudan, the Land Act came about as a policy. It was just adopted immediately, and within that, it says that the land belongs to the community. So that gap has really strained most of the things to be handled, because you see the community don't have the capacity as the government to, to do land, and the land needs a very, uh, complex issues and also uh, professional or technical things to be handled. And you find the community, uh, they just go and make committees and then they start distributing land without proper procedures, you know. And in the end, it results in uh, demolitions because people are constructing in the land. Or you find that the government uh, is not able to provide land to the, say, IDPs, like the case currently in Juba. We had thousands of IDPs who have been displaced, their lands have been grabbed, and now the government is not able to provide land to these people because they don't have that authority to say, now this land belongs to the government, let's provide 
this land to the IDPs. They have to do community consultations and, uh, you know, with the ethnic issues in South Sudan, it becomes very complex for these issues to be affected. So it's, it's, it's one of the key challenges that we see there. And then uh, um, the complexity of HLP issues. This one, we look at uh, uh, the legal aspect when you have to first get uh, your land. And then also we're looking at the, the humanitarian side when you say we have uh, uh, a returnee who needs his land. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when all these factors combine, because it's not just one thing, uh, you may find someone has got their land back and then uh, they also need a shelter. But you find that uh, the humanitarian response may not be providing shelter at that time for, for the returnees. And maybe the shelter to be put up needs to be more of a, a, a permanent one. And no kind of humanitarian support is there. We are not yet to that developmental stage. So you find that this is very complex. And sometimes, again, the, the individual might end up losing their land or they just leave the land back on there and you don't realize the durable solutions. So this is something that needs to be uh, looked into uh, as a challenge also. And then uh, we have the, the barrier to on the women's land rights. Of course, this one in the in the in the law of South Sudan is there that the women should own land. That one is very clear. But because of the norms and the culture of South Sudanese, you know, you find that women are some are sometimes undermined. Very few women who are strong enough will, will own their land, but most of them, they may find themselves even in the, the community land committees, you find there's minimal or even no women representation. So these are some of the, the challenges that we are facing in, in South Sudan. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what we then come into is uh, how uh, do we address these challenges? And that is uh, while connecting it to the durable solutions in the end. And that is what we now call the golden thread between uh, humanitarian response and the solutions. Uh, we have proposed seven. One of them is the uh, equitable access. Uh, HLP remains a critical requirement uh, to, to resettling IDPs. I believe I mentioned it earlier. And in the end, it should build the peace and they also encourage social cohesion among South Sudanese. Uh, this is because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the political conflict has reduced, is subdued, but the intercommunal one is actually on the rise and is the one that is actually threatening the peace and the stability, you know. So if uh, this one is, is looked into, maybe it will be. Uh, the big one. And then uh, development of the land tenure and the policy, uh, land tenure policy. This, uh, you know, the, the land policy is currently under review in South Sudan and it, the, it is being widely circulated, though um, the way it is done, because they lack also funds to do that, you may find that there is, a, there might be minimal contribution to it. And in the end, this is the one that is going to, to determine how land is, is administered in South Sudan. So, so this one, the review of this one, uh, uh, and uh, the land policy with the other legal associated frameworks uh, and strengthening the capacities of the land administration structures, uh, both at the national and the local level uh, should be a key priority. Uh, in order to be able to identify durable solutions in in resettling IDPs and returnees, even those who are uh, combatants before. The third one is securing HLP rights that uh, should enable livelihoods and addressing HLP grievances uh, will also contribute to establishing the rule of law, which in, in turn uh, produces conducive environment to returns investment and alleviating harsh uh, living conditions. You know, uh, this is uh, one key thing. And uh, actually, many people 
now in South Sudan, I can give an example of uh, IDPs who have settled in the, the Mangala IDP site or settlement. You know, many of them could not be able to cultivate because the land where they had settled had issues. The community there was saying, no, after the floods are done, you should go back. You know, so they could not even start to carry out any livelihood activities. Many were just doing it at their own risk, you know. So this is, uh, you find that land is really can, should be, is an element to, uh, in terms of uh, the livelihood of the people and also in the long run. And then uh, protection monitoring. Currently uh, in South Sudan, there's a uh, countrywide protection monitoring. We encourage that HLP uh, monitoring be, uh, be, be, be streamlined. There, of course, it is being done, but uh, we will have to see how we can review the, these questions so that they, they can be utilized properly uh, in order to benefit in the long term. Because documentation in South Sudan is also a serious issue, and uh, most of the, the government actually relies on, on humanitarian partners in terms of collecting data. So, uh, and then the referral pathways should be strengthened between the protection cluster and the shelter and NFI because there's sometimes that gap. And you know, AGC, if I may say, we have both been a, a protection partner and also a shelter partner, but there was still that gap because as a national partner, you may not have enough funding to be able to support someone who needs shelter. But you, you, you have identified someone who in needs of protection I mean, who is a vulnerable, I mean, uh, in need of protection, but needs a shelter as well. You know? So that, that, that's something that we encourage can be strengthened. And then uh, the in integration, you know, when we talk at the level of the government, you know, there have been uh, structures that have been formed uh, on durable solutions. Uh, there's both at the national and then the state level task forces. If these ones can work together with the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management, together with the, the Re and Rehabilitation Commission, this one should be able to operationalize the framework, which has, and then the action plan uh, on return, reintegration, and relocation of displaced persons. Because many frameworks have been developed, but there is no action taken on them. So there's need for that humanitarian uh, partners to work together with the government in order to realize this one. It is. Uh, it is happening, uh, but it has not yet taken place. And then finally is to support on the advocacy uh, for the restructuring and the alignment of uh, customer and interstitiary uh, land regimes, you know, uh, to ensure that HLP rights of vulnerable groups, uh, women, uh, the child-headed households and all those are, are protected, you know. Um, this one I would uh, particularly mention because uh, the the structures uh, in the law, the, the, the Land Act actually has uh, uh, laws, I mean has, uh, has institutions that are supposed to be put in place, especially at the county level, but they are not there in South Sudan, you know, so that's why that gap is filled by those who are not technical people, especially uh, the chiefs. And uh, if we can advocate for this one to be done, it will actually help in protecting the women rights because at the local level, they don't know the law and they need to be uh, educated about it. And this would, uh, would be beneficial in terms of protecting the rights of uh, those who are vulnerable. So that's, uh, that should be all from, from our side. Unless there's any additions from my colleagues, I have uh, peace and also um, uh, my director, William, is also at the background in case there's time. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Uh, in conclusion, uh, just, a, just a small addition is that currently we are focusing mostly on ensuring that uh, due diligence is conducted because as Alia mentioned is that we are seeing uh, multiple claims on a parcel of land. So it is important and we are also encouraging that due diligence is done 
uh, due diligence tools are being developed and will be shared with different partners. But that is to mention that it will try to eliminate or try to reduce the risk where there are multiple uh, allocations or multiple claims. Uh, other things that we are trying to do, uh, actions that we are taking, is engaging with government, uh, engaging with government to ensure that uh, they understand HLP uh, and all partners, including IOM, NRC, HDC, among others, are currently um, prioritizing this because we understand that uh, not very many people actually understand HLP, but also we also understand that it is quite uh, a sensitive issue and therefore the manner in which we do advocacy, the manner in which we handle HLP issues in South Sudan is in a way that we try to handle them uh, knowing that they are actually sensitive. The other thing that we are proactively uh, working on is uh, trying to raise awareness among women and also trying to build the capacity of uh, women-led groups or women-led organizations such that they are able to advocate on women's rights. Um, also, one of the other things that we are trying to one do last, is- um, thing, please. Just one, one last, just one. Uh, just one we thing. are calling upon, uh, we are calling upon um, development actors to also see HLP as a development issue, not only as an emergency or a humanitarian issue. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peace. And yeah, thanks for those interesting examples of some of the activities as well. And there, I think we see the links with not only what needs to be done to better integrate um, within that kind of humanitarian response, but also the links to policy, links to questions around uh, climate change and, and the impact of that around persistent flooding that we're seeing now that we didn't see before. Um, and some, yeah, again, links to the kind of administrative functions in the, in the country as well. Um, just because we've been sat for a little while, I'm going to propose that in this room, we kind of stand up if we can. And just, uh, and you may like to do this where you are, because I know when I sit and listen, <coughs> I can find it fascinating, but I still, get a little bit um, stuck in my chair. So I'm just going to sort of spin around a bit and move. And I would just invite you to do the same. Um, excellent. Ah, good. And also here, we're um, just after lunchtime as well. So I think there's a double need for that. Thank you for indulging me because I needed that. Um, great. Thanks. Um, OK, so yeah, thanks so much for colleagues from um, uh, South Sudan. Uh, we're going to move. Uh, to uh, uh, Shazan in uh, Somalia now. Shazan Karubi is the Housing, Land and Property Advisor for the Damadag Durable Solutions Consortium in Somalia. And, um, and Shazan has also been working in the kind of humanitarian response as well. So is well placed to give her, uh, her perspective. So yeah, over to you, Shazan. Thank you, Jim. Um, if you could go to my slides. Um... Yeah, we see them here. Okay. Um, Maybe yeah. it's on my side. Yeah, uh, cool. Yeah. cool. Thank, thank you, Jim. Um, as Jim mentioned, I'm the HLP advisor for the Danwa Dag uh, Durable Solution Consortium, um, but also previously worked with NRC as the ICLA specialist and the HLP AOR coordinator in Somalia. Um, so I'll just very quickly take you through um, the context of HLP issues in Somalia um, so you can just get a bearing on some of the issues that we've been working on. Um, and then I'll zoom into what Danwa Dag specifically has been doing. Um, so Somalia, similar to South Sudan, is a long-standing um, crisis, one um, that has been exacerbated by cyclical natural disasters such as uh, drought and floods, um, but also continued conflict throughout many parts of the country. So Somalia has one of the highest displacement statistics um, globally, with currently 3.8 million people displaced, and majority of these people are moving into urban centers. So you can imagine the HLP challenges confronting displacement affected communities in Somalia are protracted and multifaceted. Um, competition over land is a primary driver of conflict and particularly when it comes to violations such as forced evictions, that is one of the major protection risks in Somalia. 
um, and looking at the data between 2017 and 2022, over 1.3 million people have been forcefully evicted in Somalia. So land tenure security um, is rampant in Somalia because over 85% of informal IDP settlements are hosted predominantly on privately owned land. And majority of these settlements do not have um, formal land tenure agreements in place. So there's an over-reliance on what we call oral agreements or verbal agreements. Um, the other thing about Somalia that is important to note is with the current urbanization trends, we're seeing more and more um, there's limited access to legal identity and we're seeing increased linkages between legal identity and housing, land and property. Um, there was a very interesting study that was done um, last year on this. Um, there's also a very weak um, HLP kind of uh, uh, framework. Um, so Somalia, the, the, the HLP legal and policy environment is quite weak. Um, and we're also seeing that the legislation on land tenure security is outdated. Um, so there's quite a lot to do when it comes to strengthening the policy environment. The last thing about Somalia is that um, you cannot achieve durable solutions or have any form of sustainable reintegration without any access to land. And we'll see that on how Danwadag has been able to do it. Um, so next slide. Um, so Danwadag Durable Solution Consortium, Danwadag is a Somali word meaning common purpose. So this was, this started out as a three and a half year program. It's a consortium of different agencies, both international and local, which has contributed to the success of Danwadag. So as you can see, we have um, IOM, which is the lead agency. Um, and then we have Concern Worldwide and NRC as implementing agencies. Then in terms of national partners, we also have Juba Foundation and Gredo. Um, and REDS is kind of the knowledge management um, and learning partner for Danwadag. Um, NRC has been leading the HLP component for the consortium. So we've been relying a lot on NRC's expertise, um, both in country, but also globally. Next slide. Um, so the main objective of Danwadag is to enhance progress towards durable solutions and reintegration of displacement affected communities in urban centers. Um, so based on learning from phase one, Danwadag started off as an more of a learning kind of program where the, we were able to adapt over time. And what's interesting about Danwadag is the Danwadag theory of change was based off learning from previous durable solution programs that SDSC even mentioned at the very beginning, funded by the EU and FCDU. Um, so over time, Danwadag's program approach has been able to evolve. But one thing that has maintained from the very onset was this recognition and focus on land tenure security. So we've been able to ensure that whatever investments we are making, whether it is in access to basic services, access to livelihoods, or even um, building relationships with the government, land tenure security has been a central focus of that. So we've been able to package, have this package layer and integrated kind of support to the displacement affected communities that we are targeting. One other aspect about Danwadag is we target based on vulnerabilities and needs, and that's a whole essential aspect of a durable solution program. Um, so we target return, refugee returnees, IDPs, um, and host communities. Um, and, and a key element about Danwadag is because of how Danwadag has been built in terms of its adaptive nature, um, Danwadag has adapted kind of this flexibility to adapt the program as we move on. And that's one of the core strengths of Danwadag. So we have a crisis modifier because we recognize in Somalia, crises are consistently taking place. Um, today, you can have an emergency um, that, that goes on for, for a long period of time. So to protect the investments that Danwadag has made, we have integrated a crisis modifier to be able to consistently respond to those shocks but also maintain the longer term investments that have been that have that have already been uh, made by Danwadag. Um, and with with all of that, land tenure security, um, integrated land and housing solutions is central to that. So Danwadag will never invest without considering HLP issues. Next slide. Um, so in terms of uh, funding streams, as I stated, Danwadag started as um, 
a program that was funded by only one donor, and that was FCDO back in 2018. Um, and then that that ended in 2022. Um, and we've been able to evolve now to a multi-donor funded program. And it's quite important to note that with all these donors, HLP is funded consistently throughout the program. So with the, with the FCDO, USAID, World Bank, and the EU, there's major investments on HLP programming. Um, so how have we been able to do that? Next slide, Jim. So in terms of early solutions um, and how we've been able to integrate um, housing, land and property into emergencies, we've, we have so many examples, but I just tried to focus for the purpose of this meeting. So a large element of Danwadag is investment in evidence and analysis. So we realize because eviction risks are quite rampant in Somalia, what we've been able to do is invest um, comprehensively in eviction risk mapping monitoring and documentation in order to trigger responses because what happens is when people move into urban centers they settle on privately owned land without secure tenure arrangements in place so that makes them um, succumb to forced eviction so you can have a household that has been evicted even up to uh, multiple times um, so we've we've really invested in that through nrc's eviction program uh, we've also made, made sure that we are investing in rapid gender and land tenure analysis, particularly a good example is during the drought that we had in 2022. Uh, within the drought response, what we were able to do with NRC was to quickly map out the sites that were being targeted and understand the land tenure arrangements within sites. And this enabled us to target better because we were able to share this data across different clusters. Um, then we've also been able to integrate HLP into intercluster assessments. So working working um, hand in hand with the HLP AOR, there's a lot of advocacy that has gone into ensuring that HLP is considered as a life saving kind of service. Because in Somalia, we we always having that debate: is HLP really life saving? Then in terms of advocacy and policy influence, I think Somalia has one really good example where eviction moratorium have worked. Um, a good example is in Baidoa, whereby during the pandemic, we were able to advocate or support uh, the global, to support the HLP AOR and NRC's efforts towards um, having a moratorium in place to not evict people. And this was the first time um, in, a, in a district that was registering the third highest level of forced evictions for a period of 10 months, we were able to see zero evictions being recorded. So that was quite an achievement of what Danwadag has been able to support. Another key element is to, we worked with government um, through the various urban centers that we're targeting to establish government-led eviction task forces. And within Somalia, you cannot be successful without government steering without government steering the seat. So having government um, have these task forces in place and negotiate with landowners has really been beneficial in protecting people against forced eviction. Um, then the last element is on programming. So within programming, there are a number of things that we've been able to do, but maybe I'll just zoom in to one. The first one is on eviction prevention as a strategic approach uh, within programming. So making sure that even in terms of value for money, we're able to avert any disruption uh, to any ongoing recovery or integration processes that have brought about the impact of forced eviction. Secondly, we've also invested in due diligence as our colleagues from South Sudan uh, mentioned, um, particularly when we have emergencies, um, it's kind of a norm for um, emergency actors to just target sites without considering HLP elements. So due diligence is something that we really have invested heavily, um, especially when it comes to as a prerequisite to securing land tenure. Next slide. Um, now, in terms of durable solutions, uh, one, one of the key things that we've been able to do is on long-term capacity development. And I think the major success of Danwadag has been on how we've been able to build relationships with government and have political will pushing through some of the things that we would like to see. Um, here, we've invested comprehensively in capacity assessments across the different urban centers. We've also invested in relationships with different municipalities and states. Um, we've also 
also supported local authorities to modernize um, and improve the land registration services, particularly considering that most displacement affected communities cannot afford um, some of these documents. When it comes to advocacy and policy influence, as I previously mentioned, the HLP framework is quite weak in Somalia. When it comes to the legal policy framework is quite weak. Um, so we have some instances whereby we provided technical support during the development of some urban land laws, and this is at the state level. Um, also, one thing to mention is that we have um, HLP is considered so important that it's now a strategic priority within the National Durable Solution Strategy, and that was because of all the work that Danwa Dag and NRC had done in Somalia. Then we've also been able to influence donor priorities um, to focus on HLP. As you'll see in Somalia, whatever uh, durable solution call that is coming out, HLP is a critical component, particularly security of tenure. So that has been due to the evidence that has been collected over time, and it's quite it's a success story in Somalia. In terms of uh, programming, I'll go to the next slide so I can tell show you con co coherently what we've been able to do. Um, so uh, this minutes. is um, a case study. yes, I'm going to finish. This is a case study of an integrated settlement in Baidoa, which is now considered a home to, th to 13,000 people. So basically, it's um, why this is important. It's an example where government has allocated land uh, for the reintegration of displacement affected communities. And why it's so important in Somalia, it has shown us that um, scaling up solutions is possible if there's political will and the role that HLP plays. This settlement is not even considered an IDP settlement. It's actually more of a city extension. So it's one clear example where we've been able to operationalize um, the nexus, having humanitarian development and peace building actors, um, bringing in investments into one um, location and having a clear example of a solution. So the video, if you would like to see the video of this, um, it's, it's widely available and Jim can share it afterwards. So Jim, I'll just go to the next slide and then I'll finalize. Next slide, Jim. Um, so this is just to show you um, on the left hand side, you have what Baidoa looks like in terms of the IDP settlements. You can see people are staying in makeshift shelters. And then on the left hand side, you have uh, what we're calling a solution to displacement. So this is Barwako, as you can see, um, the kind of uh, um, planning that has gone into Barwako. Um, so if you if you would like to to watch the video, it's longer. Um, you we can share it after this. Then um, as we finalize, I think I won't repeat what SDSC has just mentioned, but I think we were on the same wavelength in terms of less, our key lessons learned is that government leadership is key to advance HLP objectives. Um, laws and policies cannot be um, enacted in a vacuum. They need to be aligned to enforcement mechanisms. Um, so, so the inclusion of infrastructure and resources That's relevant to that. Um, and then finally, the inclusion of a crisis modifier. By being able to be flexible and adaptable, we were able to see um, the role that HLP plays not only in, at the beginning of a crisis, but also all throughout and using that evidence um, to advocate for more funding. So thank you, Jim, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much for that, Shazam. Very uh, comprehensive and really interesting to see the, the different um, ways of approaching um, from that sort of humanitarian perspective, but then also from that durable solution side as well. Um, so yeah, thanks. And just to say, we'll be sharing the um, the PowerPoints and the and uh, the links to the resources you mentioned afterwards as well, because I imagine, um, yeah, there's a lot of information in these slides. Some of it really fascinating. So it'd be good to. It's all really fascinating. Um, um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be sharing that um, uh, after after the session. Okay, so our, our final country that we will stop in on, on our, our tour is um, uh, Syria. So I want to hand over to uh, Hussam Sulaiman, who's uh, with uh, UN Habitat, who's going to talk to us about the uh, work that's going on with UN Habitat in, uh, in Syria. Uh, thank you, Jen. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you a lot for uh, opening the space for, you, for Syria to, to talk about the HLB uh, situation in Syria. Uh, I will try to 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 summary the the HLB uh, context in in a few slides. Uh, so you can start, please, Jim, with the next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I I just like to 
uh, I just tried to classify the situation of HLB in three major phases in Syria. Uh, the first one is uh, the pre-war. Uh, the pre-war. It's it's the the situation before the conflict, which started in Syria in 2011. Uh, the, the the Syrian uh, con uh, context from HLB perspective is a little bit complicated, because you can before the the crisis uh, system uh, uh, is is very wide. When when you looked at it from from the legislation side, from institu institution who are working or dealing with HLB issues from. Uh, uh, and, and and from the, the policy level, so uh, uh, this make this system from theoretical perspective is very huge. But when you come to the practical side, uh, you you can find different problem on on the ground. Uh, one of, of of them is related to the uh, competition over the land in Syria. So most of people are living in in the urban areas. Uh, which make the demand and and uh, uh, of, of institution or private sector to the to to the land is 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 a huge demand and this make uh, a lot of people uh, uh, living in 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 different contexts. So, for example, you you can find that uh, approximately about 3.5 million people are living in informal areas. About 30 percent or 40 percent of people, of Syrian. In the big cities like Damascus and Aleppo are living in informal settlements. While there, there was a planning for many real estate develop, uh, development projects in these big cities, which uh, which was uh, uh, initiated to target the rich people. So uh, uh, this ha this has raised uh, a wide spectrum of 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 uh, of, of tenure uh, perspective. So you, uh, this make the. the you have this, these people who have these uh, secure documents, uh, which is is registered uh, in land record, and a, a lot or significant person who don't have these uh, uh, registered documents who are living in these informal areas. Uh, and 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 if you look to the to the land administration system from its different components, from tenure perspective or 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 from land use perspective. And development perspective, you can see this this diversity. So uh, the land ad administration institution were very weak uh, because most of 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 land records were uh, uh, as a paper were, were were stored as a paper documents uh, without uh, archiving or digitalization. Even the cadastral maps or the land maps, mo uh, there is a significant uh, percentage of these maps are croaky and not finalized. Uh, when you, and when you go to the agricultural land, you will see this diversity of 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 tenure because you have many in Syria many institutions who are managing the land use. We have the uh, we have the, the, the forest land, we have the uh, we have the, the agricultural land, the private land, the state land. So you have this diversity. Uh, and when when the conflict come to Syria in 2011. The conflict has a heavy impact on on the HLB, on the housing uh, and the properties rights, uh, because it it uh, it causes many uh, other challenges related to the loss of documents in in big cities like like Aleppo or or the resort or the areas which are outside of the government control. Um, a massive uh, amount of documents have been lost, civil and HLB documents. Uh, a, a massive damage has have been uh, happened to the big cities like like Aleppo, where you have these heritage uh, areas, uh, and and in Damascus and and, and in rural Damascus, uh, we have uh, the, the people uh, suffered from limited access to the HLB rights, uh, and uh, the, the government started uh, uh, looking and uh, to 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 build a new real estate development project in these damaged area. Which, which, which also raised uh, other HLB concern to the people, and finally the the third uh, layer was because of of the earthquake, which which happened about two 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 months uh, two months ago. Uh, this this earthquake, which uh, concentrated in in the east in the northern and western side of of Syria, has also uh, uh, has have also have also augmented this concern. And uh, and and caused uh, a lot of displacement of people uh, who left their uh, their uh, building, and uh, this uh, challenge uh, augmented in 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 these areas where the level of security is very weak, like in informal areas. Uh, 
even the the, uh, the action have been conducted by the government on the ground uh, have, uh, they didn't also consider all of these all of these, uh, 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 all of these HLB concerns. So many people have been displaced. My transaction have been has have been happened, and this uh, increased the the uh, the vulnerability for the people like the woman and displaced person. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a, a quick image for for Syria. How we can look at from a geographical uh, different challenge. So if you can look to these red areas, which is still under the government control, while you, you have other two areas outside of the government control, the uh, in in the north uh, uh, area and 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 the east uh, and the eastern uh, uh, side, and these. Uh, 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 this uh, division in, uh, geographically has also made the people also uh, suffering from a different H HLB concern. Like, for example, the people were, weren't able to uh, sometimes to return to their houses. Like, for example, uh, there was some secondary occupation for some properties. There was some force. Uh, there was a forced eviction in in other areas. In in in, for example, in government area, there was a launching of 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 several. Uh, new uh, uh, laws related to the to the uh, new urban development areas, uh, and if you look to the to to to, to this red uh, circle, which I added that when the when this earthquake earthquake concentrated in these northern areas has also augmented these all of these concern of HLB. Uh, next slide, please. So now, uh, if we look to the HLB. How uh, you inhabited Syria has, has uh, uh, take the uh, uh, these uh, HLB concern in in uh, through through its uh, intervention. Uh, the, the, the main key ch challenge of, of HLB in Syria was related to its sensitivity, as HLB is related to humanitarian uh, aspects. So it it was very difficult for us as inhabited Syria to to handle with this issue, especially with the government. Uh, so the recognition of HLB. Uh, um, uh, directly after the war was very difficult for for our team. Uh, the other issue is is the lack of capacity of the HLB actors and the humanitarian agency who are working on the ground. Uh, considering of HLB uh, was a little bit uh, 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 difficult, and uh, the the focus was on 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 the humanitarian activity without considering this challenge. Uh, the other uh, uh, challenge was related to the donor. Many do donors were very reluctant, and uh, they have many restriction to support the institution, and uh, uh, especially uh, the institution which which is dealing which which are de who are dealing with the HLB, like for example the municipalities or uh, the, the cadastral s services centers or or, or other uh, uh, or other institution. Uh, but but now after after several several years of, of working from UN Habitat uh, in Syria, uh, now UN Habitat is is taking the lead of HLB uh, uh, be, 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 because we have started uh, doing this this identification of of, of this HLB uh, identif uh, identification of uh, uh, dissemination of of our um, uh, uh, advocacy and and awareness activity with our partners. And HLB started moving from shadow to the uh, to 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 something more concrete on the ground. Now, UN Habitat is 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 leading the HLB technical working group, which is now officially is under the protection sector in Syria. And uh, UN Habitat started developing uh, money capacity building event for uh, our humanitarian actors and and recovery actors, um, uh, and and also our communication with with, with our partners. Even the government about this these concerns have started and and raised uh, in 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 different session with 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 those partners. Next uh, slide, please, Jim. Hassan, just uh, a few more minutes. So if you want to maybe uh, skip okay. ahead a little bit, please. Yeah, please do. Okay. So so uh, the, the main area of, of of response can be classified in these uh, five areas: awareness raising and legal and dispute resolution, advocacy and dissemination, capacity building. Housing, uh, housing support and improve access to HLB service. I will just give example for each of one. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example. It, it, it is not our 
you inhabit that mandate, but it, it has been done but by our partners, UNDP and NRC as a part of our joint HLB uh, projects in Syria. It's about uh, um, supporting the people with, with, with legal uh, uh, and, and awareness raising issue. And it also try to, to, to solve some dispute between the, the committee themselves. Next, next slide, please. This is an, another example of our uh, knowledge dissemination. Uh, this, this type of, of, of intervention was done by United Syria in cooperation with our regional level support uh, expert on HLB. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, we targeted the, the lack of, of knowledge by, by the institution and by the humanitarian actors. And we have, um, uh, we, we have, we have increased this knowledge by uh, disseminating different thematic papers and guidance notes on, 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 on due diligence uh, issue, on, on also on land and conflict and uh, land administration and, and safeguarding of HLB rights. And most of these documents you can find on the Arab Land Initiative website. And also on the urban legs, you can find all, all, most of the uh, HLB laws for, for Syria. Next slide, please. Uh, this is also another uh, uh, example of, of knowledge dissemination. It's uh, uh, United started working with regional partners like GIZ and UNHCR and developing an HLB framework as the guiding for HLB intervention in Syria. Uh, we, uh, we have engaged uh, with Durable Solution Working Group in partnership with NRC and UNHCR. We, are, we have also started doing support to our regional office for safeguarding of the Syrian HLB rights uh, who, who are now living in Iraq or Lebanon. Next slide, please. Just this is an, an example. Just bring it to a close now, please, Hassan. Thank you. Yeah, final, final slide. This is just uh, an example of, of our housing due diligence. Uh, which which we are supporting from from, from our projects and also from uh, in, in in our partners uh, projects. Next, the final slide, I think. Uh, this is uh, another example for supporting the uh, ac improving access to, to cadastral services in in areas which, uh, which where it have been damaged or lost, and also supporting the archiving of land records. Uh, sorry for being long, and thanks a lot. No, thank you, Hassan. I really appreciate that. And um, as I said, we'll be sharing the um, the slides. And if you'd like to put any of the links that you mentioned um, in the chat, but we can also make sure we circulate the relevant resources as well, because there was lots of things you mentioned there. So I appreciate it. And thank you for um, uh, yeah, sort of just bringing that to a, to a close. I think mm -hmm. we've been quite ambitious in our program here, is what I'm realising. Mm -hmm. um, it's always my yeah problem anyway but yes thank you so we've had our visits to mali south sudan somalia and syria and um we're going to hear a couple of reflections on this but i want to just pause for any um uh, questions uh, just for a couple of minutes before hearing those reflections from colleagues so if there's any questions either in the room or or online Mute your microphone so it hits you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sylvain. I work for the Swiss mission uh, in Geneva, and um, I'm following in particular the, the question of uh, refugees, UNHCR. And uh, thanks again for, you no, know, I thought that was a very comprehensive overview, and we, we travel ar you know, across those different contexts. Uh, I didn't personally have much knowledge about a a HLP uh, beforehand. But I was really stunned by the, the complexity of the issue uh, with no legal, financial, social, cultural, and so on uh, ramifications. It seems to be, in some cases, both the, the driver also of displacement, for, especially for uh, IDPs or related to climate change or conflict, but also a protection issue in itself and the, the, the main obstacle to durable solutions. And I think that's reflected by you know, the stagnation of the, 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 the you know, uh, solutions uh, situation, both for IDPs, refugees, I think it's only 1% or, or less, or maybe even less probably, and also the average, average length of displacement. So all this very interesting, but the, the picture seemed, is quite gloomy uh, to me. And um, I thought now I was one. I was going to ask the the, the question: What are the, the positive examples you would have best practices? And I think it was really quite encouraging to hear you know some uh, 
different uh, uh, interveners from, for example, from uh, Somalia. I thought that was a very interesting um, you know, example. And I was wondering, uh, since in that case, there seems to be quite a few lessons learned already and you no know, really best practice engagement of government, etc. If there is a potential there for scaling up, how would you see that in different contexts? And since I'm uh, working quite closely on the operation of the Global Refugee Forum, I was also wondering what are your expectations from such a kind of you know, high level event in terms of acceleration of this HLP uh, agenda? Maybe last, sorry, very long, but since the, the, the IDP issues is, seem to be so, no, it's, it's always seems to be more complex even than the question of returnees, refugees. How, how is the link between, you know, how, where's the link with the, uh, the action agenda? Thank you, great questions. Um, we could do a session on those questions and then we'll have to organize another one. Um, Shazam, would you like to respond on the, um, the issue around the potential for learning from Dalmadag and, um, um, and then, yeah, and then we'll come to the next, maybe Kaylin, you might want to speak to that or, or someone else as well. Um, but yeah, Shazam, over to you. Sure. Um, so on Barwako specifically, Barwako started back in 2019 and it first started with the relocation of a thousand families. And then in 2020, with increased funding from IOM and from Danwa Dag, um, we, we relocated an ad additional 1,009 families. So currently there are about 13,000 people settled within Barwako. Now, there are plans uh, with funding from the World Bank and a new durable solution program known as Samienta. Um, so Danwadag and Samienta. Samienta is implemented by IOM, UN Habitat, and UNDP. Um, and with Danwadag, there are plans to relocate an additional 1,000 families. And as I said, Barwako is now considered as a city extension. So it's part of the urban master plan for Baidoa. Um, Barwako is being used as kind of the model to replicate in different urban centers. So there are plans in other regions such as Jubaland to look at large scale government led relocations. Um, then we also within Danwadag have a very interesting program that is being funded by USAID. Um, it's, it's called a Resilience Challenge Fund, whereby we're going to look at specific um, aspects of Barwako and what made Barwako successful and try and see how we can replicate and scale that. Um, so it's quite, it's very interesting and it's, uh, it's currently on its kind of piloting phase. So we're fast uh, trying to see what we know and what we don't know. Then based on the what we don't know, we're going to do um, comprehensive research pieces. And these comprehensive research pieces are going to lead into pilots, not only in Baidoa, but um, across various locations in, um, in Somalia. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunities for scale up of the Barwako model. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Somalia with the complexity of challenges has also led to some real kind of innovation happening as well, which I think there could be more done to try and learn from and think about how we can adapt and how it might be relevant to use some of those approaches in different contexts as well. Um, yeah, I think that's you know, partly why we want to have more of these conversations to try and share more of that kind of knowledge and approach. Um, Kaylin, I'm going to turn to you um, to uh, respond a little bit to GRF question and also to um, just bring some perspectives from the sort of the, the policy and kind of systems uh, reform type side. So uh, yeah, over to you, Kayla. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think maybe coming, uh, I have a couple slides that uh, I think will speak to some of these questions, but I do think we have opportunities to bring the HLP issue into some of the system and policy conversations that are happening. You've mentioned two of them. So the GRF, I think is one really important one. The S2's action agenda is another, but then we have a couple other options as well. So I think um, maybe if we can pull up those slides quickly. Um, so I think uh, we've heard a lot today about the different challenges that arise linked to housing, land and property and it's linked to solutions. So I'm not going to, to go into detail, but there's, there's a couple mentioned on the screen. I think one is it's clear that we have systemic barriers to resolving these issues. This is not a one-off. This is not something that just happens independently. There's really real issues that we see that are consistent. And so we need to be thinking about that in a more systems way. Um, and also looking at how we sort of uh, bridge the policy to the practice. So we heard a lot about the Land Act in South Sudan and 
all of the good things that are included in that, but then when actually push comes to shove, we're not seeing it be implemented at county level. Um, we know HLP issues, as you say, can be a, a source of conflict, a source of displacement in and of its own right, as well as being a barrier to solutions. Um, and I think the, the colleagues from Mali really spoke to that and, and the challenges that that creates. Um, we know also that uh, failing to address HLP issues can become a barrier to making progress on other issues that are essential for solutions. So the ability to restart agriculture and livelihoods of different forms. Um, and then really, I think this, this dramatic risk that evictions can pose in, in not only driving new issues, but also setting back the gains that have been made on progress towards solutions. So I think in, in this landscape, as you say, a very gloomy picture on some level, um, but I think also something that there is growing recognition of the need to address both as part of humanitarian response and as part of development. Um, so maybe if we can go to the next slide. So I think what we see is it's clear that HLP needs to be a shared priority. It needs to be something that each part of our broader ecosystem takes up and really integrates into the core of its response. Um, and I think that uh, Shazan and Somalia said, you know, on some level, this is really an opportunity to operationalize the nexus. We talk about the nexus as a very abstract kind of up in the clouds concept sometimes, but I think this is a perfect concrete example of something that can be a shared priority between humanitarian development and peace actors. Um, so I think from NRC's point of view, um, there's a few issues that stand out as, as clear priorities for us. One is that uh, HLP needs to be thought about and considered and brought in really from the outset of a crisis. They can't, this can't be something that waits for years down the line before we start thinking about it. Um, and so we need to think about what that means for us. What does that mean for humanitarian actors? How do we build that into the response uh, from the very beginning? Another is we do need to make sure this is also a priority for the development community and that that somehow links in the middle so that humanitarian actors have someone to partner with when it does come to these broader system issues. Um, something that hasn't come up too much today, but I, I think is also clear as a priority is it needs to have, HLP needs to have an anchor in the coordination system. Whatever form that coordination system takes, it, it needs to factor in somewhere. Um, and we know that the model looks slightly different in different countries and, and maybe that's fine, but it does need to have a home. Um, and that needs to be preserved in whatever sort of iterations of, of the coordination system we see going forward. Um, we've talked a little bit about making sure HLP comes in to uh, sort of humanitarian and development plans. Uh, Shazan mentioned that in Somalia, HLP is now reflected as part of the national solution strategy, which is fantastic. Um, and so again, we need to think about how we make that bridge and how we really embed it in, in the different tools that are at our disposal. Um, and then something that's not on the slide, but should be is, I think this question of financing. How does financing enable our work on, on housing, land and property? How do we make sure that we have the flexibility to be able to adapt? How do we have those crisis modifiers as part of our, our program approaches so that we're not just stuck in a single track that then fails to adapt to a changing context? Um, so with these priorities in mind, um, I think then the question is, well, what do we do about it? Um, and uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. I think what we see right now is in some ways our system is in a point of transition. We see a number of different initiatives and processes that are looking at different parts of this landscape and are looking at how we do this better, not just in relation to HLP, of course, but in relation to our broader structures. So we see efforts to look at whether our humanitarian system is fit for purpose in responding to internal displacement. We see that there's new momentum on solutions, particularly, I would say, around the internal displacement side with the appointment of the special advisor on solutions, but then also, obviously, with the GRF happening this year, I think it's clear that there's a lot of momentum and energy around that. Um, I think we also see renewed attention to the effectiveness of coordination, our coordination architecture and the systems. I think there's a recognition that it's pretty heavy at the moment uh, and not always delivering on uh, on what would be needed of a, of a system that, that's so complex of that nature. Um, and then I think there's also um, sort of ongoing efforts to rethink how we plan our work within the humanitarian community. We obviously have the humanitarian program cycle, um, which again is a very heavy tool. It has clear benefits and it has a clear purpose, but is it, um, is it, is it suiting our needs uh, with the amount of work it takes? So we have these different sort of system processes that are happening right now. Um, and if we can switch to the, the last slide, 
I think then the question uh, and the opportunity is how do we build HLP into these different processes? And I think there is actually a very clear entry point. Uh, oh, I lied, and it might not be the last slide. Oh, no, it is the last slide. Um, uh, I think there are clear entry points. So when we look at this issue of sort of the question of is the humanitarian system fit for purpose in responding to internal displacement, we have the IASC independent review of humanitarian response to internal displacement. And one of the questions is how does the humanitarian response lay the foundation for solutions? And I'm sure everybody in this room and online would agree that housing, land, and property is an essential part of that. I know it's something NRC is administratively hosting the review, so I uh, have a bit of insider knowledge, which I uh, will take advantage of and, and say that I know this is on the sort of priority list for the review team as well as one of the issues they're aware of as really being um, an essential sort of ingredient of this solutions uh, recipe to, to stick with the metaphor. Um, so I think there there is an opportunity linked to that. Um, I think, uh, Sylvain, you brought up the, the SU's action agenda on internal displacement. We have Robert Piper, who I think is really bringing a lot of energy to, to this solution conversation. And he's currently working in 16 countries to drive progress on solutions. And I think all of us can help in making sure that in those 16 countries, HLP is recognized as a priority issue. And we can do that through our organizations, through our permanent uh, or our, our, our delegations on the ground. Um, to make sure this is on the agenda. And I know it is already coming up uh, in part thanks to some of the colleagues on, on the line um, as part of the solution strategies and, and the work he's doing at country level. Next year, he'll be looking at sort of how to consolidate those learnings into more systemic approaches. And I think, again, that's an opportunity to think about how do we really bed these into the tools and the processes that are used for solutions at a system level going forward. Um, on the coordination side, we have the OCHA flagship initiative, which I'm sure everyone is starting to hear about, um, which I think is, is a bit of a rethink on, on coordination and, and a bottom up rethink. And so again, I think it's clear that we do need to make sure that HLP comes into whatever future coordination architecture um, comes out in, in these four countries where we have the flagship. Um, if it's area-based coordination, fine. Where does, where does HLP fit within that? How do we preserve the, the technical expertise and the attention um, regardless of, of the different forms coordination can take. Um, and then finally, I think uh, when it comes to sort of how we plan, there is work uh, happening on, on humanitarian program cycle reform, um, but I think it also is something that needs to be thought about in the context of um, the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, so that it is, again, bridging both the humanitarian planning tools and the development planning tools, um, and is really speaking across that entire system. So I think, um, gloomy picture aside, there are opportunities that we can take advantage of to, to bring HLP into this work and really address it at a policy and a system le level. Um, I think one thing, again, that's not on here is uh, all of the opportunities linked to financing, but there is the grand bargain, there is the good humanitarian donorship. We have some of these other sort of ongoing financing conversations, and I think really the importance of the flexibility and the crisis modifiers and the links to HLP can be brought into those discussions as well. Um, I will leave it there, um, but uh, just to say that I think uh, this is something that also that will require our collective engagement. Uh, all of us have foot, uh, footholds in these different processes, and so if we're able to really use them to push the importance of HLP, it's one way of making sure it's on the agenda. Thanks, Kaylin. And uh, yeah, great to kind of make some of the links to some of those uh, sorts of systemic policy uh, things that are happening as well um, that, that have a massive influence on in what we do programmatically. So appreciate that. Um, I'm aware of the time, so thank you for your patience. I'm going to hand over to Ombretta <coughs> Tempra, who's going to um, give us some um, some sort of thoughts from, from her side as the, the, the other co-coordinator of the Global HLP AOR and with UN Habitat as well. So Ombretta, over to you for a, a few minutes and uh, then for us, us here, we'll have to carry on the Q&A just outside there, because I think we might get kicked out. Yeah. I'm not sure how secure our tenure is beyond 15 years. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, thanks uh, for to all the presenters. So a really great presentation. I really uh, um, enjoyed and learned a lot. Uh, I'll not hold you for long, but I would like just to to present to to, fre to 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 represent some of the things we heard from the development perspective, bridging now to the humanitarian. I know that's 
um, uh, there are the two sides of it. Uh, and uh, from Yen Habitat, that's the angle we would like to bring in the HLPOR and in this discussion as well. Um, I'll skip some of the slides because I know we are kind of tight, but um, you know, when we look at housing, land and property lights, sometimes the us and then the human, the development community say, uh, let's say, uh, looks at it also with different terminology and names and generally the one that is used more commonly, the one that appears, for example, in the sustainable development goal is the land tenure security, uh, which is in a nutshell, you know, who has the right to do what, where, for how long and under which circumstances and conditions, which applies to the housing definitely, but also some of the elements that some of uh, you mentioned, you know, um, growing food, food security, you know, the case of Mali or uh, natural resources, etc. So when we look at it uh, and we try to address this aspect from the development perspective, uh, we look at it from the land governance perspective. Um, which has the ultimate, uh, definitely, objective of uh, bringing peace and sustainable development uh, that tackle economic, social, and environmental issues. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, many of you mentioned the policy and legal frameworks that definitely are brought a lot into the humanitarian discussion, the HLP discussions, uh, but we see that we need to see also, what institutions are there that, you know, um, that act on these policies and frameworks and what is the land information infrastructure that sustains basically the administrative aspects of this equation. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we look at housing, land and property, we definitely look very much and a lot about land tenure security, basically the rights of the people, but there are other components that we we do oversee or we put on the back burner when we are discussing in the humanitarian context, but that definitely need to be addressed and brought in at the same time if we want to establish sustainable uh, development, durable solutions, uh, and uh, overall also conflict uh, prevention when we look at the conflict cycle. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the, the detailed description, uh, but uh, definitely there is the aspect of valuation of the land, you know, the taxation, the fees, also the, uh, you know, how we, the, the, the public can, um, can use the land and repurpose it, for example, for housing the displaced. Land use is extremely key because if land use is unsustainable uh, in terms of really agriculture, uh, but also uh, natural resources, exploitation, water, definitely, you know, the rights that we allocate on those land will also not be workable on the long term and will lead to disputes. Uh, and overall, the land development, how we stimulate uh, you know, the construction, for example, of housing. We know that we struggle to provide shelter and housing, but we know that also it's the private sector that at the end provide housing at scale. Uh, and we saw countries like Syria, where basically one third of a housing stock was destroyed. How not only us as humanitarian come in and provide shelter, which definitely can only cover a minimum bit of the of the housing needs, but how we stimulate actually um, the private sector and other actors to produce housing so that people can be adequately housed. And lastly, you know, how do we record this information? We saw some example from Syria on how we support uh, the, the, the functioning of the land records, but definitely we cannot protect people from eviction if at the end we do not have a place where we, we know and that this information is stored or who are the legit, legitimate owners and how we make sure that when we resolve disputes or when we reach negotiated agreements, these negotiated agreements are actually translated into uh, records. Uh, and therefore, I mean, we spoke a lot, I mean, and these are my last two slides really on how to tackle housing, land and property rights during or let's say in the immediate uh, um, time of conflicts, you know, when we provide emergency shelter, a little bit moving towards durable solution, mitigate and resolve land disputes and protect from violations. Um, uh, but at the same time, we basically need to act on what happens in the land governance spectrum before 
the conflict as conflict prevention or after in the recovery phase and overall in the development. And these are really some of the typical um, intervention that as developmental actors uh, and also some of you mentioned, you know, in the, when you look at the sustainable development frameworks with the national actors, which are really at the key of, of, of making this sustainable, how we provide adequate housing at how we clarify and record the land rights in the statutory and customary system, resolve disputes and then, uh, you know, record them uh, as uh, the resolved disputes, how we ensure that sustainable land use in terms of policies, but also um, administrative framework is put in place. Uh, and overall, that these solutions that we provide are not only technically feasible, but also politically sustainable on the longer term. Um, so with that, I think I would like to thank you and hand over back to, to Jim uh, for, for the closure. Thanks. Thanks, Ombretta. Thank you. And yeah, really interesting and super important. How do we think about it from that, that side of things as well? And how do we better integrate um, uh, yeah, many of the areas you're talking about? Um, yeah, sort of aware and thinking about land value and just saw my colleague from the Mine Action AOR here who yeah, that's something that we're thinking about how what happens when we sort of see land get get have, be cleared and become into use and then the land value changes and how do we we work that out and what are the systems that we can use to capture that and um, so yeah thank you everybody for for being here um i'm i'm aware we haven't had really any time for questions and comments and i I'm, I'm annoyed at myself for that um i was ambitious with what we could fit into this set this session and i'm really pleased to have heard the inputs from colleagues but i am aware we haven't heard from from others of you so i i want to say sorry for that and also this is going to be a conversation that we carry on in the quarterly HLPAOR meetings with this is going to be a theme that's going to run through um, and so hopefully there'll be lots of time to interact in the future but yeah I just want to acknowledge that because I'm sorry I've been to places where I don't get to speak and it winds me up a bit so and I'm now that person so there we go um, so I'm sorry but thank you for being with us and um, thanks so much for all the presenters um, so many of you and I, I won't I won't name you all right now but I'll, we'll be sharing uh, the present presentations a follow-up with some resources as well um, and if you're not on the HLPAOR mailing list, I'm going to leave, if you're in the room, I'm going to leave some cards just on the edge there if you want to email me and then you can get put on that list. Um, and if you're already on there, well, we'll hope to see you again in the future. But yes, please do. Let's carry on the conversation. And uh, uh, thanks so much for, for being here. Um, I think we need to go and bake an HLP cake to use a, a, a recipe metaphor. Um, but yes, thank you. And uh, have a good rest of the day. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.